will focus on companion planting of our veggies. First, I present an overview on the topic. Second, in our neighbor to neighbor chat, Gardener Pat and Gardener Sonia will uh, discuss two uh, seasonal topics. Finally, our panel will discuss questions or issues that were uh, submitted during registration. Okay, uh, I will start with uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, companion planting veggies. Uh, that uh, uh, today I would like to talk about the companion planting veggies. Companion planting is a, a practice of planting two or more spaces close together to gain benefit either on growth, flavor, or pest control. Traditionally, people thought vegetables had friends and their foes based on their experiences. Nowadays, there are more scientific explanations behind this theory. Now we can find out so many company on planting information on the internet. Actually, too many you can find out. Just type companion planting. You may hit many, many lists. But if you can check their list, you may find the discrepancies for the information. Companion planting based on folklore or hearsay. So please be careful to check these resources. Please make sure you get the educational institute like universities, corporate extension office, government or reputational uh, nurseries. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, companion plan uh, planting, there are a lot of benefit and the, this I need to explain. Uh, one is a protect, protecting a pest because of a specific scent or and then chemical plants produce work as insect repellent or uh, uh, detail critic does. For example, garlic and then uh, arugulas are uh, this under this category. And then second, attracting beneficiaries. Some plants attract beneficial insects or birds. For example, borage attract pollinating on bees and then tiny pest eating wasps. The third one, providing shade. Large plants provide shade for smaller plants in need for some protection. For example, corn or broccoli. Under broccoli, we can plant lettuce, supporting the tall plants like corns and uh, or sunflowers can support lower growing spurring crops such as uh, cucumbers and then peas and then uh, for farm improving plant health. When one plant absorbs certain substances from the soil, it may change the soil biochemical history in favor of nearby plants. Example are uh, lettuce and then turnips. They prefer similar but still different organic matters and then they can help uh, each other. The first one, uh, the he found improving soil. Some plants like beans make nutrition more available in the soil and the other plants get the benefit from this. And the last one, suppressing weeds. Planting sprawling crops like squash or pumpkin under cones minimizes open areas where weedy typically take hold and they also keeps moisture. The picture of this slide shows a cabbage with a nostalgium. Uh, nostalgium thing is good to repel insects like cabbage looper and the aphid from cabbages. Slide next, please. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the famous, the most famous companion plant in the world. I see uh, this uh, combination from even not 
American、uh, textbooks or other places. Corn, pole beans, and then squash or pumpkins. Pole beans provide、uh, nitrogen to、uh, corn that requires a lot of nitrogen to grow well. Corn contributes that the pole beans are able to climb the corn stalks. Also, corn's high canopy of、uh, corn forage may confuse the adult squash borer and then reduce the damage of this pest on the squash. Squash scrap spread both leaves that provide living、uh, mulch for the corn and the beans. Native American myth speaks of three sisters who could not get along, but are、uh, convinced to use their differences to help each other. That came from originally.、Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this picture is shown in、uh, my vegetable garden last year. As you can see, corn is the center and then left side. And then I, the right side has uh, uh, the, the squash, and then that covers、uh, corn and then uh, uh, pole beans.、Uh, that, uh, this combination works very well, and then I found the squash didn't have problems. Uh, with the squash growers、uh, until late, later the corn was died out. So I recommend it. it's really great, but、uh, you have to be careful to、uh, seed and then plant、uh, these three combinations. One year, several years ago, I planted the corn and then four beans at the same time. And what happened is corn could not、uh, raise. Tall enough, and then the, the poor beans got much faster. So I had problems to deal with that kind of things. And then corn didn't、uh, grow really tall enough that year. So、uh, you need to plan、uh, careful enough to do this uh, combination. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that the、uh, bad companions negatively affect uh, that, uh, that the fighting.、Uh, A、uh, competition of shallow roots that is like、uh, the lettuce and uh, the, <clears throat>、uh, the flowers, uh, other uh, things. And、uh, the lettuce and then cheese, uh, chips uh, like that. And then releasing chemicals prohibit growing near plants. That really famous for black walnut and then fennel.、Uh, around that、uh, the plants, the other vegetables don't grow、uh, well. So you try to avoid these plants to do next to that.、Um, and then attracting a pest, that is really problems because you have to be careful with this、uh, uh, potatoes with pumpkins are、uh, really. Uh, famous or you know,、uh, really bad examples. And then herbs, warm wood should be avoided. Other herbs, sometimes you can find out the different uh, uh, combinations, but、uh, typically it works as well. Next slide, please.、Uh, companion planting charts are widely available online. And this chart on the list includes more flowers and then herbs nowadays. I recommend to plant more flowers and herbs with vegetables since、uh, I have noticed less pollinations, pollinators、uh, around the,、uh, this uh, area. Uh, so, that,、uh, you know, if you have more flowers, You can、uh, bring more pollinators, and it means、uh, you know, easier for us to get more you know, fruits or vegetables. Next slide, please. <clears throat>、uh, this is、uh, just one example how it works with a、uh, uh, companion plant.、Uh, that,、uh, like uh, this case, is lettuce.、Uh, but it's,、uh, you can see there are four k i n d of vegetables get along. And these vegetables are different to work. And then, like,、uh, you know, broccoli are improved soil and then shade for lettuce. And the algae grow well、uh, together. 
and uh, carrots protect each other from pests. That is a uh, carrot leaves uh, had a uh, uh, kind of a uh, distinct smell so that uh, avoid the lettuce for uh, pests. And then uh, lettuce uh, provide the uh, uh, carrot for carrot aphid. And then turnips attract the beneficial uh, insect. So they can bring uh, the uh, more uh, that the uh, insect to eat bad insect, and uh, you have to avoid uh, chives. Shallow roots fight is uh, between these things. So you can see these are different work for the, the companion plant. Next slide, please. This is a. Uh, part of my last year's uh, vegetable garden, you can see that the uh, you know, flower brings uh, like a butterfly and then also a lot of bees. So it's a kind of a proof for how flowers work for vegetable plants. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, next, yeah. Oh. Okay, uh, that I recommend also recommend you to uh, the use flower bed. It's kind of unusual, but nowadays more and then more popular to do that. And then this is my front yard. It's uh, uh, kind of uh, interesting, but people never realize you plant uh, uh, vegetables. I have uh, the, the lavenders. There are three at least three brahmendas are uh, left side and the right side behind and the center small one is lavenda and then there are potato you know right now this is current uh, my front yard and then there are potatoes are growing and then that the uh, tall long stuff is green onions and then there are garlic there they are uh, kind of uh, you know plant uh, uh, companion plant but also helps each other with the flowers that the lavender helps that the smells. So I really encourage you to uh, challenge with the front yard uh, or not the front yard, but that's your garden uh, flower bed. Uh, it might be fun. Uh, next slide, please. There's our resources. And then there are a lot of resources more than this, but please be careful to be the source where which one is uh, repeatable and then uh, reliable information. And uh, I didn't cover for container, but the container plant is also uh, available with the companion plant. Thank you. And if you have any questions, just to write the chat. Thank you very much. And then now we can move to uh, the <clears throat> The, the, oh, Maria, I'm sorry, do we have any questions? No, I'm sorry, we don't have any at this point. Okay, all right, then uh, we just can move to our uh, neighbor to neighbor chat. Uh, Garden apartment uh, will cover tomatoes with basil, parsley, borage, and then gardener Sonia will cover broccoli with crimson clover, clover, nasturiums. Um, Gardener part, let's uh, hear some tips about the tomatoes with basil, parsley, and borage. Thank you, Toshiba. <clears throat> we, um, Toshiko, we um, have a lot of agreements. You've said a lot about um, the overview of companion planting, and I wholeheartedly agree that more flowers, more herbs in your garden um, are a great thing, no matter what you're growing. Um, for me, gardening is about tomatoes in the summer. So we have this dream of a great harvest. We, we, we look at the, the seed catalogs, we look at different magazines over the course of the winter. And we dream of tomatoes and we dream of tomato sandwiches and salads and other sorts of ways to enjoy tomatoes. But while we're dreaming of tomatoes, the pests are also thinking about tomatoes. And here we have, um, three different common pests. And these are only just a few of the many problems we can have with tomatoes. This is the tomato hornworm. This is the white fly. And this is a type of um, mold, I think, on this one. I can't remember what, what this photo was, I forgot. 
it's, it's not, um, but all of these are, are preventable problems or at least we can reduce the problems with our tomato plants by following some of the companion and partner planting um, research that we now have. Next photo, please. Next slide. Um, when we're looking at companion plants for tomatoes, the three top, and I think these are the favorites that a lot of people have in their garden, um, are basil, parsley, and borage. All three of these are beautiful plants, for the most part, easy to manage. And they also have the added benefit that we can cook with these. So as um, we talk about these types of companion plantings, this is not just for the in-ground beds. This is for any type of container that you might have in all of these plants, basil, parsley, and board, they're decorative, they're very beautiful. Um, the way companion planting works in plant partnerships, that they get, they help control pests without chemicals. And what they do is some plants will lure the um, pests away from the, um, the plant we want to protect. There's other plants that are trapping and, and, and trick, you know, tricking the bad um, plant from um, the, the, excuse me, the bad pest from attacking the, the plant. It's, it could slow down or deter the pest. And also it brings in a lot of beneficials from butterflies to different types of bees and other types of flies that we want in the garden, the natural enemies of these pests. Next, please. Uh, we'll start with basil. Basil is very popular. There's many types of basil. Um, and all of them, I believe, will have some sort of benefit to tomatoes. One of the things that I read was that it also enhances the flavor. Now, I can't really vouch for that scientifically. So I'm going to just stick with what uh, we can, we can um, find from the research. Basil is easy to grow. You don't necessarily need to buy it from a start plant. You can um, buy a variety of seeds online, start them directly in the ground when the soil warms up, or um, start them under grow lights a little bit before the time it goes into the garden. Also, basil is readily available in all sorts of places, from garden centers to big box stores, and even grocery stores during this time of the year. The benefits of basil are that they repel a lot of the bad guys. White flies, oh, spider mites was the other picture. I, I forgot how I did. Spider mites, thrifts, which they are supposed to um, possibly transmit spotted virus, uh, wilt, aphids, and hornworms. Tomato hornworms are the big giant green bugs. Um, an easy way to repel tomato hornworms is just constantly looking at your tomato plants and looking for it. It's big and it's ugly and you can remove it pretty easily. And also basil with the, the beautiful flowers attracts a multiple variety of pollinators, including bees, which we need, which will help with vegeta uh, vegetable pollination throughout your garden. Next, please. Parsley, um, a simple, simple green plant, not a lot of wow factor in the flowering department, but it's a real work. Course. There's two types of parsley that you can find seed wise. One is the flat leaf and the curly leaf. Parsley is easy to grow, it's edible, and it overwinters, which in some ways I think is re really where we get the benefit for um, a lot of pollinators because on the second season, it's a biennial, the second season, it will not um, be very good to eat, but they'll put out very um, beautiful white flowers, and that attracts a lot of beneficials. The one thing that parsley does attract over the course of the growing season the first year is hoverflies, and those are the good guys. Hoverflies eat a lot of the pests that bother tomatoes. One of the things you can consider parsley for too, you don't necessarily have to integrate it with your vegetable garden. You can use it uh, as an attractive 
plant, filler plant in a container of flowers, and then you can use the leaves over the course of the summer, snip them off as needed for cooking. And the curly parsley, especially, makes a beautiful border. The front of a, a bed, um, and it's very easy to, um, to harvest, and it brings in beneficials too. So all of the, the three um, herbs that I've been talking about really have a beautiful use for beyond the vegetable garden. But I think it really, um, having these in your garden really helps with understanding that you cannot just have one type of plant in a garden situation. It, the variety is really what helps in the end, I think, um, reduce pest pressure. Next, please. Now, borage. Borage might not be in everyone's um, seed um, stash right now. And it's one that I found about five years ago. Um, and it's a beautiful plant. It's an annual. It's easy to grow directly from seed in the ground. In one thing, good or bad, it's self-seed. So once you have a borage plant or two in your garden, what's gonna happen is you're gonna find in the next spring, seedlings popping up all over the place. But they're easy to ID and remove or relocate if you don't want it. Pass it on to other gardeners that you have. But if you look at the flowers, they're absolutely beautiful. You can eat the leaves as well as the flowers. I really haven't done that yet, but I have something in the resources that gives you some other ideas for that. Borage repels the dreaded tomato hornworm and also the cabbage worm. I didn't realize that until I started researching it. It attracts many, many beneficials, bees and other beneficials. It's a beautiful plant. It's tall and upright for a while, but I found here in Virginia, in Northern Virginia, once it gets really hot, it kind of gets um, moldy. And if you just cut it back or pull it out, um, you'll have a second flush with the seeds that fall. Um, for the fall, but it, it kind of loses its oomph once the, the really dog days of the summer get here. One of the things that borage does is that it's a dynamic accumulator, which means that what it, it's sort of like comfrey. If you're familiar with comfrey, the roots are very long and they'll go into the ground and gather up the nutrients that are in the lower level of the soil and bring it up so it makes the nutrients become more available to the surrounding plants. Just as the way um, Toshika said that um, beans do that, the legume family, they, they pull up nutrients from the soil and they make it more readily available to the other plants around it. Forage acts as, as this type of plant. Also, from what I've read, you can also use it as a mulch. You know, once the leaves die down, in the, the uh, heat of summer, you can chop and drop and leave it to cover the soil, throw it in the compost bin. And also just like the plant comfrey, you can make some sort of um, liquid tea by making a sort of a brew. Uh, I haven't done that, but that's another way to add nutrients into your soil. Next one, please. I want you to remember one thing is that there's many different combinations for plants. Um, and the main thing to remember is that the variety is really the best thing. You don't have to have the, the plant necessarily, the companion plant immediately next to the plant, but if it's within a short distance from another part of your garden, that will help too. So I looked at uh, companion planting and trap cropping from the University of Minnesota. The borage one was, a new one to me. I didn't really know a lot about borage's other uses besides being a nice, um, beneficial, uh, you know, a, a nice beneficial uh, attractor. But there's uh, many uses for it. <laughs> so this might be an interesting article if you want to look at this, the many uses of borage. <laughs> and then um, the latest book that has come out for me that I've read in the gardening community is called Plant Partners science-based companion planting for the vegetable garden. It just came out um, last winter and Jessica Walliser has been making the rounds as I was telling my gardener friends before we started here. Um, so this podcast and she can explain 
you know, how she does her, she did her research for this book, but the, it's a wonderful resource if you're looking to add to your um, gardening book collection. Never can have too many gardening books. Thanks. Okay, we have one question. Um, it's not related to the subject matter that we just had. It's from Alice about how to grow winter. She wants to know how to grow winter melon. Perhaps we should wait until the end of the program. Okay. All right, Toshika, you're next. Yeah. Yes. Uh Part, it was a really uh, important uh, matter that uh, presentation. Uh, now, Gardener Sonia will discuss a few tips on broccoli with crimson clover nasturtium. Crimson clover is one of green manure to uh, enrich soils. I'm so excited to hear about crimson clover and then nasturtium. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, we're discussing broccoli uh, and then the different plants that are good to plant with it. Next slide, please. Oh, I think you went, went, yeah, here we are. So broccoli is uh, part of the family of uh, cabbages. Um, it's a crop that you can actually have two uh, sowings of, so you can get two harvests. The first harvest is uh, one if you start seeds six to eight weeks before the last frost and then transplant four weeks later. You, you, in Virginia, you need to make sure that it's a heat tolerant variety because they tend to not like heat. And of course, we've got lots of that in the summer. And then you can get another crop in the fall and um, you plant the seeds directly in the ground in June and July. Uh, broccoli is a very, very healthy plant. It it's a, has lots of calcium and other great nutrients. And because of that, it's a heavy feeder. It, it, it pulls all the nutrients out of the ground and into the broccoli, which makes it so healthy. So when you plant the broccoli, you wanna plant it with either a good bit of compost or some fertilizer. And you wanna, um, make sure that there's plenty of calcium and boron. Specifically, if you don't have enough boron in the soil, you'll have, um, and that's what causes the hollow stalks. I don't know if you've come across that from the garden. Um, the good news is with our clay soil, which is not a great thing at all to have, it does have a lot of nutrients in it. So it does not tend to be a problem that you won't have enough calcium or boron in your soil here. However, um, next slide, please when you're, uh, well, anyways, the broccoli pests that are the worst in the Virginia area are these lovely little green worms. Um, the cabbage looper, the diamondback moth caterpillar also has a nice uh, kind of darker, uh, more caterpillar looking furry-ish worm and the imported cabbage worm. Those are the three big ones. Aphids are also an issue uh, that we deal with. Um, and I don't know if you've ever grown a, uh, a cabbage type plant, but they can be voracious, these little worms. And they can also can show up in your broccoli when you're uh, cooking it, which is never fun. Next slide, please. So uh, enter nasturtiums, which are a beautiful plant and they are an edible plant, you can eat the flowers and they can, if you put the flowers in your salads, it can make for a very attractive salad. Um, nasturtiums are interesting because they tolerate poor soil. So they're great to plant with broccoli because they will not steal the, uh, um, the nutrients from the broccoli. And so they can be planted right up next to the broccoli. They act as a, a cover for the ground. So they suppress weeds. And they also um, give a little shade to the shallow roots of the broccoli. Nasturtiums are very interesting. Not only do they attract beneficial bugs that um, will also help pollinate that are beneficial for the, the broccoli, 
they uh, they can act they act as a um, a trapping crop. They'll actually attract the cabbage looper and the cabbage worm, and uh, and those little critters will end up on the nasturtium instead of on the broccoli. Um, if you get a big batch of them of the bugs on the nasturtium, then you can just pull the plant and uh, and compost the plant and. And so you have one very interesting way to limit the number of little critters that end up on your, your broccoli. Aphids, from what I read, are not as big a problem for broccoli in Virginia, but they are. And the aphids tend to prefer the nasturtiums as well. So they are a beautiful and uh, very beneficial crop to plant next to your broccoli. Uh, I also read that for organic gardening that you can cover the broccoli with a, with a fine um, fabric and that helps to keep the, broccoli, the, the pests away from the broccoli. Um, there's also a bacteria that you can buy that it's called Bacillus thuringiensis would be tea, it's a powder that you can put on the broccoli and that diminishes the, um, the, the, um, the worms. It, it's not toxic to humans, it, but it gets into the gut of the, of, the, of the bacteria, of the cabbage worms and it, and it kills them. So those are a couple other uh, ways to suppress the little bug situation. Um, a th another, once you cut your broccoli, what I re read is if you soak the broccoli in warm salted water, if there's anyone visiting, those visitors will, uh, will tend to fall off the broccoli uh, and uh, float to the bottom so that you don't end up with that extra protein in your stir fry. Next slide, please. So nasturtiums, you can plant them indoors a few, six weeks before the last frost or you can plant them directly into this into the ground seed them half an inch below you know seed, seed depth of half an inch they tend to prefer the soil temperature to be in the 70s so you have to wait a little bit longer before you can plant the nasturtium seeds or germination is 10 to 14 days and they're nice big seeds so they're very easy to see and they're quite easy to plant and there's all sorts of varieties last summer I grew a beautiful variety that had variegated leaves and crimson red flowers. They were quite attractive. This year I got some vining ones to see how they look. Next slide, please. So clover, it's got a, it is an interesting plant. It it's, has a bit of a different uh, use than the nasturtiums. It, it also helps to control weeds and attract beneficial insects. Uh, there is an article out of University of Hawaii that says that if you have um, a clover that's growing, this one they talked about with strawberry clover was particularly good, it would actually trap some of the pests and um, the broccoli harvest would be larger. Uh, the clover controls erosion and it also works to loosen compacted soil. Um, Clover, you don't. You have to be careful when you plant the clover because if you plant the clover along with the uh, broccoli, it it can take away the nutrients from the broccoli, and you end up with a smaller broccoli yield. So the you the use the big use for clover is to actually um, to put nutrients back into the soil over the winter. So what the recommendation is is that if you're going to plant clover you plant it in the fall uh, alongside your already happy growing uh, broccoli um, so that it starts to grow and it's small and it's, it's blocking the weeds, but then over the winter, the clover over winters, it takes over the space after you've cut down your broccoli and it acts as a green manure. So uh, in the springtime, when you go back to your garden and you, you till down that uh, that clover. It actually you just leave it right there, and it um, it acts as a 
as a nutrient source, specifically uh, nitrogen. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. And um, the, the roots also help to loosen the soil. So it's a great thing to do. Um, the clover comes later, I guess, after your nasturtiums. Next slide, please. So the, um, the resources that I looked at growing, one, one from University of Minnesota Extension, growing broccoli in the home garden. Actually, there's quite a bit of broccoli that's grown in Virginia. And the one was a particular discussion of the types. If you, if you wanna know what kind of broccoli to grow in Virginia, they do look at different varieties of broccoli. So that's an interesting article. Um, and then the Cornell University Co Cooperative Extension has a great article about companion planting. The University of Hawaii Cooperative in Extension, it was an interesting article, but I think it, um, and it gave me some information, but it tends to be more for um, if you're gonna plant an entire field of broccoli, then um, your few bits that you have in your garden. And that's it, that's my, my review. Oh, but you can eat crimson clover flowers. So, I mean, that makes it interesting in that way. I have not tried that myself, but they are, it is quite a beautiful plant. Sonia, I'd like to add something to the Nasturtium um, fan club. Um, I, just, I just read um, this, this year with the book that I just, you know, got the plant partners, the new book that I, um, I just read. And um, this woman said there's been a lot of research to help with um, the dreaded squash um, vine borer. And if you plant nasturtiums first and let them grow up a little bit to more of a plant size, and then you plant your broccoli or any other squash that has a lot of um, <clears throat> potential to, to get the, the squash vine borer, which are more of the summer type squashes, that the nasturtiums will help prevent that. Oh. I, a year from now, I'll come back and, and review. <laughs> I'm going to try it this year for the first time. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I'm very optimistic that maybe we might get, you know, bumper crop of um, zucchini or summer squash this year by um, just using some nasturtiums. And they're beautiful, as you said, and they're, they're definitely um, attractive if you put them in salads. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I have experience, um, I, not the, uh, myself, but the, so my next door uh, that uh, brought into my community garden, uh, he planted the nostalgia all the time and the flower is always beautiful during the summertime, just keeps flowering. And uh, he gave me the leaf and then taste kind of interesting taste. So it's nice to, uh, to put in salad, I can tell. Uh, I tried to plant and then I didn't succeed one time. So after that, I have not tried, but a, definitely I'd like to try again this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the one thing, um, Toshiko, is it, with the nasturtiums, I've never had really good luck, but this year I was on a mission to try to protect my, my summer squash. So what you have to do for the seeds for the nasturtium, because they're so hard to cover, you, I, what I found the easiest thing to do is I took a, my containers for starting um, outside and before I planted the nasturtium seeds, I rubbed them on a concrete step. And it, 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 you know, it's a multiple times, they say either, you know, a nail file or sandpaper, but I'm thinking if you have a concrete step somewhere in, in, on your property, use that as a emery board and it, it mixed it just enough to open up the seed. And I had almost perfect germination this year. Because last year I had like three um, nasturtiums grow. Mm. Mm. They're a little bit tricky to get started from seed. Uh, but that, that trick worked. I know the soaking and all of that, but uh, heck with soaking. <laughs> just get it done quickly, right? <laughs> I, I would recommend that for this year if you want to give it a try. Yeah, I, I think that is a reason I didn't succeed. I didn't have a lot, you know, just I planted on the soil, but it uh, didn't come out. Uh, like, you know, while I planted many, but it uh, didn't show up. So that might help. Thank you. The outer casing is so hard. It doesn't really uh -huh. break down quickly. Okay. So. Yeah. 
That'd be great. Okay.